Here we go. It was challenging all morning long to make everything work. So I think we just found our new carpet now, which is great. There it is. All right. Happy Mother's Day to you if you are a mother. So that's an awesome thing. Thank God for our mothers. Um, we're going to start by prayer, and then we'll go into our first song, which will be In Christ Alone. Let's bow in prayer this afternoon. Lord, thank you for the day and for your watching over our lives. We thank you for our moms, and for those of us whose moms have already gone on to glory, I just would uh, want to help us just to be thankful and to remember and to be able to honor their memory. And Lord, those of us who still have mothers, I pray that you would cause us to uh, love them and be thankful for them, give them a call, and, and cause them to know how much they are appreciated. We love you today, and I pray that this would be a, a wonderful day in your house. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So we're going to ask you to stand. Um, that's the way we normally would do it. If you're able to do that, we'd like to stand with us. You can in Christ alone. will be the first song that we sing together. found. He is my light, my strength, my song, this cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest dart and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are stilled and striving cease, my comforter. Fullness of God in helpless babe, this gift of love and righteousness, scorned by the ones he came to save. Till on that cross, as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied. of the world by darkness slain, first and born in glorious day, up from the grave he rose again, and as he stands in victory, since curse has lost its grip on me. have a seat and then as you're getting ready to sing the second song which will be complete in thee uh, this is a song that Priscilla introduced to us a couple of years ago I think it was and we have enjoyed it, it has an interesting uh, phraseology to it sometimes the words read a little bit differently than we would speak in normal English I've noticed that it was written in the 1800s and it is uh, continually and slowly becoming much more popular. Those who know it really have uh, come to appreciate it. So complete in thee, no work of mine. I 
justified, O blessed thought, and sanctified salvation wrought. Thy blood hath pardoned, bought for me, and glorified I too shall be complete in thee. No more shall sin, thy grace hath conquered, reign within. Thy voice shall bid the tempter flee, and I shall stand complete in thee. Yea, justified, O oh blessed thought, and sanctified salvation wrought. Thy blood hath pardoned, bought for me, and glorified I too shall be complete in thee. Each one supplied, no good thing to me denied, since thou my portion, Lord, will be. I no more complete in me, yea, justified, blessed thought, and sanctified salvation. assembled are among the chosen I will be at thy right hand complete in thee yea justified all blessed thought and sanctified salvation wrought thy blood hath pardoned bought for me and glorified blood of Jesus has purchased our pardon. What a glorious and wonderful truth that is. Nice to see you here this afternoon. We had a wonderful time this morning. A group of about a similar size was here, and I had some folks tell me just how absolutely grateful they are for the opportunity to come, and I hope that today will be a blessing for you too. Mother's Day, of all days, we ought to be at church together. I would say that second to Easter in terms of, of the Sundays that I enjoy being together. We're going to read from Proverbs 31. So uh, go ahead and turn there. Proverbs 31 is that great passage on that wonderful wife. Proverbs 31, verse 10 and following. Just a few things to say about it. Um, I have one friend that I can think of who said, I never feel very comfortable on Mother's Day because when I read this list, I know that I don't live up to it. And of course, no one ever will or ever could. It's not intended to be a checklist that you have to do everything on the list here to be a good mother or a virtuous wife. They're the kinds of things that you could do. And if, if you're a husband and you have a wife, you ought to be noticing in there not the areas where maybe you would say, well, they could do better, but all of the areas in which they do so well, and there are so many of them. Um, there's only one person in the Bible, one woman in the Bible, who is call, called a virtuous woman. If you look at verse 10, who can find a virtuous wife? It literally is in the Hebrew, isha haya. And you say, well, that doesn't help me very much. But an isha haya is a woman of valor. And every other time, except for this one occurrence, when it's used, it refers to a man of valor. A man of valor is a soldier, a warrior, a judge, a deliverer, someone who is of, of great courage and extremely noble. So Samson and David. Uh, David have 30 men who are known as men of valor. So you think about that for just a second. A man of valor is a person who would pick up his sword and defend the fatherless and those who are in need. But it's talking here about a woman of valor, and there's only one in the Bible, one real person, and it was the great, 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 I think two or three greats, grandmother of Solomon. So do you know who it is now? It would be Ruth. Ruth is the only woman, only lady in the Bible ever called a woman of valor. So when Solomon is writing this to probably his children, he's saying, be like grandma or great grandma, uh, more likely. 
because she was wonderful. So would you listen as we read the account of the virtuous woman, uh, the Isha Haya, kind of a handy little thing to know there, and see uh, what she's like. Who can find a virtuous wife? For her worth is far above rubies. The heart of her husband safely trusts in her, and he will have no lack of gain. She does him good and not evil all the days of her life. She seeks wool and flax and willingly works with her hands. She is like a merchant ship. She brings her food from afar. She also rises while it is yet night and provides food for her household and a portion for her maidservants. She considers a field and buys it, and from her profit she plants a vineyard. She girds herself with strength and strengthens her arm. She perceives that her merchandise is good, and her lamp does not go out by night. She stretches forth her hand to the distaff, and her hand holds the spindle. She extends her hand to the poor, and yes, she reaches her hand to the needy. She is not afraid of the snow for her household, for all her household is clothed with scarlet. She makes tapestry for herself, and her clothing is fine linen and purple. Her husband is known in the gates when he sits with the elders of the land. She makes linen garments and sells them and supplies sashes for the merchants. Strength and honor are her clothing. She shall rejoice in time to come. She opens her mouth with wisdom, and on her tongue is the law of kindness." She watches over the ways of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. Her children rise up and call her blessed and her husband also, and he shall praise her. He praises her. Many daughters have done well, but you excel them all. Charm is deceitful and beauty is passing, but a woman who fears the Lord, she shall be praised. Give her the fruit of her hands and let her own works praise her in the gates. And Priscilla has a song to sing.
a mother to be praised. Thank you. And she's not here, is she, right now? You have one of those. But... Oh, she's in the back. Okay, well, great. So we have one more song that we will sing before we look into the scriptures together. It is 318 in your hymn book. I believe in a hill called Mount Calvary. Bill and Gloria Gaither, and I noticed there's a Dale Oldham. I don't know him as well as I know the other ones. I think uh, there's going to be quite a, quite a time whenever Bill passes. I don't know. He must be in his 80s. Certainly has been a gift, hasn't he, to the church, writing so many songs together. Let's sing together all three verses of 318. As we travel this earth shifting sand That transcend all the reason of man But the things that matter the most in this world They can never be held in our hand I believe in a hill called Mount Calvary I believe whatever the cost And when time has surrendered And earth is no more I'll still cling to that old rugged cross I believe that the Christ who was slain on that cross Has the power to change lives Day. For he changed me completely, a new life is mine, and is that why by the cross I will stay? I believe in a hill called Mount Calvary, I believe whatever the cost, and when time surrendered and earth is no more I'm to cling to that old rugged cross I believe that this life with its great mysteries surely someday will come to an end but faith will conquer the darkness and death and will lead me at last to my friend i believe in a hill called mount calvary i believe whatever the cost and when time has surrendered no more us to cling to that old rugged cross. All right, thank you for singing with me and smiling as you're singing. I appreciate that. Ask any song leader, it's always a little disconcerting that you spend most of your time singing to people that look like they don't want to be singing. That's often the case. So you just come to believe that they mean it on the inside, even if they don't show it on the outside. So uh, I'm sure that's good. I'm going to ask you to take your Bibles for our sermon time and turn to Colossians chapter 1. I have the passage on the board. And Luke, I'm going to switch over to the other microphone. If I were to stop and reflect on how many times things have not gone well in the church service, there's quite a few, you know, where sound doesn't work and the batteries go dead. And and we had about six things that didn't work this morning. Most of them, it's really true, as my mind comes back, is when I'm talking specifically about Christ, is usually when things go bad. And I'm, I'm not superstitious or hyper-spiritual or anything like that, but I have come to believe just almost to expect that 
there will be attacks from Satan and and things don't always go as well. So we're gonna talk about Christ this afternoon. So I would appreciate your prayers, both for myself and for you, as we, we think about the glorious supremacy of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Um, I have on the board there, starting with verse 15, I'll read it. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation, for by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things consist. And he is the head of the body of the church, who is the beginning. This is Christ. He's referring to Christ being the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. And it goes from his created nature to uh, his creative nature, excuse me, in creating things, all the way to his resurrection as the final reason why he is to be fully preeminent in all the world. Let's bow in prayer and ask the Lord to help us. Lord, this afternoon, I just really do pray that you would minister to our hearts, that you would challenge us as we look at the word of God, and that we would be able to put Jesus, our Savior, in his rightful place. Lord Jesus, you deserve to be first in everything first in our affections, first in our thoughts, first in all that we do, first in our intentions, and certainly first in our time of worship here today. Give us insight and help us to see you in all of your glory and splendor so that we could love you more, so that we could be anxious less, so that we could adore you more, so that we could sin less, so that we could worship you more, so that we could be selfish less. Pray that you would Uh, work now. Bless us. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. One of my favorite stories about Martin Luther, and he has a lot of stories, is the story that he told one time about after going into a deep funk, in other words, a difficult time of of sadness and darkness. Uh, Many of the famous preachers that you know or have heard of, they often had real difficult times. It's just the way it is. You know, if you're going to impact the world and and be different and serve the Lord, that Spurgeon was the very same way. And after about the third day of really a, a pity party for himself and discouragement, his wife decided that it was time to, to to take action. And so she went up and she got dressed in her black uh, robes and everything that you would wear, prepare for, to go to a funeral. So she was all dressed out, garbed out, and, and everything necessary for a funeral. And she comes walking down the stairway really slowly. And, and Dr. Martin looked over at his wife and said, who died? And she said, God did. And he began, as most preachers, they're, they're more willing to talk than to reflect sometimes. He began to give her a lecture on how silly it was to assume that God died. And then she says, oh, well, by the way you were living, I assumed you thought that he had died. And of course, then she learned a lesson to realize that if I fall into a funk, he learned the lesson, if I go around with my tail between the legs and, and are all discouraged, I'm assuming that God has abdicated the throne and is no longer alive. And that idea right there that we need to keep God on the throne is a huge one. In the text in front of us this afternoon from Colossians chapter 1, Paul is trying to exalt Christ and put him back on the throne and put him as first place in our lives. Um, J.B. Phillips is an interesting man. He wrote a book a few years ago trying to help individuals who were going through difficult times, and it was called Your God is Too Small. And in the book, he says, you know, we often think of God as that man upstairs or that fatherly figure. We think of him as that meek and mild person or the, the managing director or the person who sends us good things. But if we really saw him in all of his awesomeness and fear and glory and holiness, then we wouldn't struggle nearly as much. That is true. I, I do believe that that is true. But I believe that there's even a, a deeper need. And the deeper need that I believe we had is not just that we think that our God is too small or our thoughts of God are too small, but that our Christ is too common. When we think of Christ, it isn't just his greatness and his awesomeness and his power that we should think about. It's his sweetness. It is his tenderness. It is the way that 
he, he ought to be first in all that we have. Your real problem is, again, not that your God is too small, but that your Christ is too common. He's too much like you, and too much like me in our thoughts and minds. He's not as sweet to your taste as he really ought to be. He's not as beautiful to your eyes as he really ought to be. He's not as precious in your affections as he really ought to be. He's not as glorious in your thoughts as he truly deserves. And he's not as supreme in your heart as he really ought to be. And so what do we do instead? Well, what we do instead when Christ is not first in all that we think about, first in our affections, is we choose something else. And we choose to sin because Jesus is not sweet, because Jesus is not beautiful, because Jesus is not precious and glorious and supreme and as wonderful in our lives as he ought to be. And so we come to this passage, uh, verses 15, that's up here on the board. If you would like to see it from there, you can be looking down in your scriptures. Paul's going to go through three different ways that we can observe Christ or compare Christ, understand him so that we could put him back in his place, give him the rightful place on the throne of our hearts and our minds and our imaginations and affections. All of us, our minds are filled with imaginations and affections, things that we like, things that we want, things that overtake us, and it could be anything from a sporting event to a new vehicle to a new piece of land to a new person. It could be a new book or a new uh, dress or a new suit or uh, money, whatever the case would be. All of those things begin to take over and, and really fight for our affections when we ought to be fighting for the affection of Christ. We ought to be fighting for him to be number one and have him be as sweet as he can be and as precious as he can be in our lives. We sing that song a lot, don't we? Lord, you are more precious than silver. Lord, you are more costly than gold. And, and that song there is making contrast about Jesus so that we could think, oh yeah, you know, if I had gold in my hand, I would think that's pretty good. If I had silver in my hand, I would be really careful with it. I would not lay it around. I wouldn't lay, leave it on the street. I would put it in a pocket that didn't have holes in it. Well, if I would care for my silver and my gold in ways that would cause me not to lose them, then what I ought to do, what ought I to do with Jesus Christ? And so he makes three contrasts in the, the text here. I can point over to it. The first contrast that he makes is how Christ is related to his Father. How is Jesus related to his Father? He's going to tell us about that. And then he talks about how Christ is related to creation itself. And we'll talk about that in verse 16. And then he talks in verse 18 how that Jesus himself is related to the church. So what were they again? It is how does Christ compare or what is relationship with his Father? What is his relationship with creation? And thirdly, what is his relationship with his church? And as I look at those three uh, ways to look at Jesus or compare him, all of a sudden he begins to flow to the surface and to the height of our lives, and we begin to appreciate him partly for whom he really is and what he deserves. The idea of this three-way analogy is really interesting. Uh, the John Deere Tractor Company, I'm sure that you're familiar with them, they've worked really hard over the years developing uh, radio broadcasts that would control tractors. And so they have these towers and they connect from tower to tower to tower and your combine or your tractor can log into it. And if you need a tractor to go down the field and not deviate by one one inch to the left or the right, they have the ability to do so. And so it reads from these, these different towers, and, and let's say you're trying to, well, the, the main reason they do it is sometimes people like make these hills, and then they plant on the top of the hill. So they go right over the top, you put your fertilizer there and go back in the same place year after year, and it reduces package and, and um, compaction in the sound, ground and stuff like that. Well, the way they do that is with three towers. And with three towers, looking from different directions, they can uh, find your altitude, your, you know, everywhere that you are on the face of the earth without uh, any way. Um, let me give the ideas. The, your latitude, your longitude, your altitude, and your location based on this idea of triangulation. And so uh, 
if you're worried about the government, and some of us are a little bit, um, they know where you are. They know what you're doing if you have a cell phone in your pocket and they can tell, you know, within probably three feet, two feet, I don't know exactly, I didn't look that one up, because of those three towers. So let's look at Christ now from three different ways, three different relationships, so that we can come to appreciate who he is and what he is like. The first way that we can see that Christ is absolutely glorious and that he deserves to be savored and loved is because he is the image of the invisible God. The word image that is being used over here in verse six, uh, 15, he is the image, it's literally the word the icon. And we're familiar with icons. Icons are on our computer. You click on an icon and, and Bill Gates and those guys, they figured out that this would point to that and would start up this program. An icon in ancient culture, in the Greek language, was always a physical object that represented something spiritual or something intangible. And so they would make an idol or they would make an icon and it would point back to a demon or a god or some other being that they were wanting to worship. Now we have some examples here. Like if you look over at the flag, uh, we love the American flag and I think we ought to love it more. Uh, There were so many people who have lived and died for the the privilege of being Americans, and and while you can probably think of a couple of reasons to criticize our country, um, do the the fence test, I think this is a great way, tear down the borders of a country and see if everybody runs in or they run out. And the fact that everybody wants to run into our country tells us that we have a pretty good country in comparison to others. The flag there, though, is, is like an icon. It reminds us of something great. There is freedom behind it. There are soldiers behind it. There's the Revolutionary War and the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence and the Bill of Rights. All of those things are bound up together in this union that we have. And so um, a few years ago, there were several examples of, of people burning flags. And we don't like that. We don't appreciate that. Not because we can't find more cloth. Not because, you know, you know, just that piece of cloth is of unique value. It's the symbol behind it. And so when it comes here and it says that he is the image or the icon of the invisible God, it tells us something wonderful about Jesus. No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten son who is in the bosom of the father, he has declared him. And here's what it means, that God has never been seen. And even when in the Old Testament, when his presence was in a location, they never could see his face. In fact, as close as you ever come is in the book of Revelation where you begin to see maybe a little bit of his arms and his robe. And so the idea about God is he's unseen and he is uh, dwelling where? Well, we're told that he dwells in unapproachable, what? Unapproachable light. So trying to approach Almighty God the Father, who is so different than you are, so unique, so unlike anything else, would be like trying to approach the Son. You can only get so far, and you will be destroyed in the attempt. Just think where we would be. What would our lives be like? What would be, what hope would we have in this world if all we could say is, well, I, want, I have this hope of approaching God, but he's inapproachable. God knows this, of course. God has a love for us. God has a love for you. He sent his son, and so he, he determined and identified a way whereby we could come close to God, we could understand God, we could approach God, we could be forgiven by him, we could know him, we could begin to understand. And, and uh, just as Moses, when he was hit in the cleft of the rock there in Exodus chapter 33 and 34, that as uh, God passed by and proclaimed his glory, the Lord, Lord, gracious and long-suffering, abounding in mercy and loving kindness, that he saw the hinder parts of God. Now you think about that a little bit. So by, by using the words the hinder parts of God, it's like the after-burning glow. So after all that God is has moved forward, as the the ground is heated up behind him or or as his glory, the Shekinah is still sitting there. Just that afterburner was almost more than he could handle. And so the Lord in his graciousness says what? I'll send my son. 
and I will make my son to become one of them. And so Jesus entered into the womb of the Virgin Mary and was born um, without sin, without a human father, and the Holy Spirit came upon Mary. And so because of that, as Jesus entered into the womb and became one of us, he therefore began the process of making a way that he could bridge the gap between unapproachable light and people like you and me. And so who does that? And why would they do that? And what does that mean? Only a person of great love because as Jesus came down, all of the, the things that he did in the, the uh, ascension, not ascension, but the descension, excuse me, when he came down to our level, are the exact opposite of everything that Satan said in Isaiah. He says, I will ascend to the heights. And there are five I wills that Satan makes in Isaiah. Those are are contrasting with the ways in which Christ came down and became one of us and humbled himself and died on the cross. And so he becomes for us, again, the icon of the invisible God. When the disciples were asking Jesus about the Father, show us the Father and Uh, King James says, it sufficeth us. I have a little trouble with that word sometimes. What does that mean, it sufficeth us? Or it is enough. That's the way it's often translated now. If you could show us the Father, we would be absolutely satisfied. That would be good enough for us. And you know what? They were correct. Um, When when people talk about this idea of showing us the Father, they, they use the idea in theology of the beatific vision. You've not heard of that word for a long time, but the beatific vision is if I could have this one sight, this one vision of glory, this this one thing that would be beyond everything else, I would never hunger for anything else that is less than glorious again. And the only thing that will so capture your life, you know, once you've seen it, is God himself. And so they were correct. Show us the Father, and it sufficeth us. It's enough for us. It's sufficient for us. And then Jesus said, if I've been with you so long, and you haven't seen the Father, he who has seen me has seen the Father. In other words, as you look into the face of Jesus, and you see the way that he responds to you as You think Jesus, when he was in a crowd with the disciples and they were fishing and doing other things, would do what we do? You're talking to maybe your kids or your your brother or sister, your parents, and halfway through the conversation, you're already thinking about something else and you know they're not listening, you know, or, or you're not listening to them. You think Jesus would look at you and you could just see that his eyes were kind of like drifting off because he was thinking of about the other things he has to do this afternoon. No, you know absolutely with a shadow of doubt that the love of Jesus would be so great that if he was listening to you, he would listen to you with all of his being. That is a description or a revelation of what the invisible God is like. When you pray to God, and even though we may, we do, don't we? We drift off in our prayers and talking to him. Um, most of us, we'd probably say about half of the time our prayers never really get completed because we get interrupted or we fall asleep or things like that. He never drifts away from listening to you. As you've heard me say in the past, if, if you don't recall, when you're praying to God, it's like you're the only person in the universe because you are. Only God is omnipotent and omniscient and omnipresent. And so when he listens to you, he listens to you completely. I learned that by looking at the way that Jesus loved his children. Having loved his own, the disciples, it says in John 13, 1, who were in this world, he loved them unto the end. In other words, he loved them with perfection or he couldn't find any way that he could love them anymore. And that exegesis of the Father, that revelation of the Father in his ability to to spend time with his disciples reminds us of the love of the Father. I'm really moved, by the way, 1 John chapter 5, I think it's verse 13, that we know and have come to believe the love that God has for us. You ought to think about that, that when I think about God's love for myself or God's love for you, it isn't a matter of feeling it, it's a matter of faith. I come to believe that when God says, I love you, that he does. And so it takes faith to even believe how much he loves us. So 
as I observe Jesus, the way that he heals the sick and treats the poor and, and those who are the outcasts and those who are the sinners and, and those who have leprosy. It's interesting isn't how many times that he touched the leprous person or, or he took spittle and made mud and, and put it on the eyes of the blind. There are all of these ways in which he demonstrated that he didn't look at people and go, ooh, which we sometimes do because our love is not nearly as deep as Jesus' love is. But he, in his love for us, repeatedly and continually and constantly showed us something about the Father. And so what is he? Number one, the first of the three triangulations is he is the image of the invisible God. I need to come to understand who the Father is, and I do so by this one person who is the Lord Jesus. By the way, the portal by which we see the glory of God in the face of Jesus comes to us, 2 Corinthians chapter 4. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled from those who are perishing, whose minds the God of this age is blinded, who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is an image of God, should shine on them. Now, that's a long sentence, and sometimes we just think, well, that's more than a mind can comprehend. But let me explain to you what that was, 2 Corinthians 4, 3. He's saying that the light of God shines on the world, but there's someone who's coming and throwing mud in our eyes or ruining our glasses, and so it's the the devil, uh, Satan, who's trying to keep the light of God from shining on us, and that light is there, and uh, Jesus is that light. In him was life, and he is the light of men, and the light shined in darkness. What? And the darkness comprehended it not. And so we don't have the ability in our, our natural state even to see the glory of God. But the glory of God, as it shines on us, comes through the reflection of one place and one person. It's Jesus. It's the light of the glory of Jesus that reveals to us how wonderful the Father is. And so we think of an icon, we think of it as something that reflects and reminds us of something that is hidden. Jesus was given and Jesus came into this world to exegete, to reveal, to explain to you, to bring you near, to help you to see, to bring you into relationship, to make you a friend of an invisible God. And for that reason, and that reason alone, I ought to love him. I ought to obey him. I ought to think of him as precious, as delightful, as wonderful. Triangulation number one, he is the image of the invisible God. Number two, when we see the second way that we can compare Christ, we can compare him to everything else. Of course, you go from God. What else is there? Well, everything else. And so it says this about him. I'm going to read it right here in the text. He is the firstborn over all creation. Now, when you hear the word firstborn, uh, Jonathan and I had this discussion after the service this morning when we talked about it, is the Jehovah's Witnesses, they like to jump on this verse and say, see, it says that he was firstborn. And so if he was firstborn, born, then there must have been a time in which he was not. And so it sounds like the the council of Nicaea when they came and said, there is never a time in which he wasn't, which is really uh, good theology. Firstborn, though, the idea of being the firstborn either means to be first in one of two things. So catch this and you'll be great. Either first in rank or first in order. First in rank or first in order. And I'll give you some of the verses that demonstrate this is the way that they viewed the idea. Um, When the Lord was talking to Pharaoh, and he told the Pharaoh that I want you to let the children of Israel go, he said, Israel is my son, my firstborn. Let him go. Now, the point is, he's saying here, not that, well, of all of the nations who have ever been born or have come into existence, Israel was the first nation. You say, no, Israel wasn't the first nation. The nation of Israel really didn't come into being until the time of Jacob. There were the Assyrians before that, and there were the Sumerians, all kinds of nations that existed before that time. It isn't that he was the first nation. It's that he is the first in rank. In other words, God chose Israel to be his, what? His firstborn. So is that first in rank or first in order? 
and is first in rank. So when I look at the verse here, you can look at it with me. When he is the firstborn over, over all creation, it's either saying that he was the first one born, and we're going to reject that right out, and we're going to say that he is the first in rank. He is above everything. Probably one of the best examples of how this plays itself out is in an extended promise that God gave to David. So when, when God was uh, looking for a king to rule over Israel, he sent Samuel out to go and anoint one of the sons of Jesse. You remember that? And so Samuel shows up and he asks Jesse, you know, uh, bring your sons before me and and that will be great. And so the first one comes and Samuel goes, oh, he looks good. He's handsome and strong and everything. And the Lord says, don't pick him because man or God doesn't look as man looks. For man looks at the outward appearance, but what does God do? God looks at the heart. And so he says, you know, I've rejected him. And then number two goes by and then number three. And they get all the way down through seven and they're all looking at each other thinking, well, I guess that's it. And Samuel says, this doesn't make any sense. The Lord said one of your sons, Jesse, would be king. And they go, oh, we almost forgot. There's this little kid, the, the, the shrimp, if you will, down there. He's chasing the sheep around the valley. Go get David. And, and the other seven brothers, they would have probably laughed that David would even have an opportunity to come and stand before Samuel. And so when Samuel saw David coming, the Lord said, up arise and anoint him because I have chosen him. And so is he the first son? No. Second? No. Third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh? No. He's the last of the sons. Listen to the promise that God made to David. This is from Psalm 89. And you ought to know Psalm 89 and the covenant that God makes with David and Christ through it. But my faithfulness and my mercy shall be with him, and in my name his horn shall be exalted, and I will also set him over the sea and his right hand over the rivers and he shall cry to me you are my father my God and the rock of my salvation and I will make him my firstborn the highest of the kings of the earth now you can hear in this Christ can't you and you should hear Christ but the first reference is to David verse 27 again and I will make him my firstborn, the highest of the kings of the earth. My mercy I will keep on him forever, and my covenant shall stand firm with him. And his seed I will also make to endure forever, and his thrones as the days of heaven. And so here he says to David, I'm going to do this for you and this for you. And he's exalting him and making him king over everything. And so to be firstborn means to be chosen, to be elect, to be the one who will be first in rank. So looking at the text, when it says that he is the firstborn over all creation, what he's claiming there is that he is just so far superior and so far beyond all that ever is in the world, why would you ever worry about an engine that blew up? or a car that got hit by a deer, or a deer by a car, or a window that got broken, or a broken arm, or a broken leg, or even a broken heart, or any other things that we have that, that seem like they break down and fall apart because Jesus, if you possess him, is so much greater than all of those things. And so as he is first in order, he's the creator of everything, and, and I should not allow anything in my life ever to be a distraction away from that which I already own. Be content with the things you have, Hebrews says, because what do you have? The Lord is my helper. The Lord is the one that I have, therefore I will not be moved. Think about it for just a second. If he is creator of everything, then he is so far beyond it, and we ought to exalt him. If there's ever anything that is beautiful in the world, anything that is glorious, anything that is delightful, anything that is precious, who should I thank? If you had a good meal this afternoon, if, if you enjoyed a good time with your family, if you looked at a beautiful sunset, if you liked the stars. This is an interesting thing that I've noticed. Out of all of the reasons I've been uh, sad about the fact that my eyes don't see as well, I think the, the greatest of them is I notice I always used to look up at the stars at night and get out in the middle of the country and, and turn off the car and, and just, just observe everything. And, and it's so hard to see them now. And, and there's certain ones that I can see better than others. Jesus put those all there. 
just by the word of his mouth, let there be light. And, and he made the stars also. Literally in the Hebrew, the, when the words that are, he made the stars also, literally. Stars, that's all that's there, that, all in that phrase. Just by saying the name stars, which were not even in existence or in anybody's thought, all of the universe came there all at once because of this person who is first in rank over everything. And so as I think about him this morning, the first of our comparisons or relationship is he is the one who reveals to us the Father and brings us near to him. He is the one who has created everything. Now, there are two categories, by the way, of things that were created as important, everything visible and everything invisible, which seems pretty obvious. Everything that you can touch, taste, feel, break, or eat, whatever the case would be, anything that, that is in the universe that you see. And so there ought not be anything in the known universe that could distract me and cause me to love Jesus less. What's less? What, what else is there other than the, the known universe? Well, He's um, the firstborn of all creation before by him were all things created that are in heaven and earth, visible and invisible. What's invisible? Well, now you have thrones, dominions, principalities, and powers, the spirit world. And so he is in charge of, and he's claiming to be the one who controls all of them. And so if you've ever had the fear of being attacked by demons or tempted by demons or wondering about what you can, uh, what they can do to you, excuse me, you have absolutely no fear because there's someone who outranks them completely, and it's the Lord Jesus. And so I've come to believe, by the way, as I started this sermon uh, this afternoon, that I have seen on occasions, it seems like there are just going to be multiple things that go wrong. And it's often on the Sundays when I talk about Jesus, I just think, well, this is something that the Lord has generously and graciously allowed into my life to teach me either this or that or the other thing or, or simply to be dependent upon him. And it reminds me on the days when things don't break, that they didn't break because God was there. And so he is the one who is in complete control. And I have no need to fear anything because he is, he outranks everything visible and he outranks everything that is invisible. The third and the last of the categories that I want to look at, the third of the, the trifecta or of the, the three things that give us an opportunity to look at Christ from this angle and from that angle, and then the third angle is simply that he is Lord over the church, that he is the lover of the church, that he is the supreme Lord. And so I would say it like this, that point number three is that he is most glorious because he is the sovereign Lord and lover of the church. Look at what he says there in verse 18. It says, 17, he is before all things, and in him all things consist, and he is the head of the body of the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn of the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence, which is what we've been trying to do today, make him have preeminence in everything. And so he is most glorious because he is head of the church. And so here we are, Sunday afternoon, and we've gone through a difficult month, haven't we, with a, a lot of challenges, and different churches have attempted different ways to minister, and and to go forward, and, and we've decided that uh, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of the Lord, so church is essential. You know that I think that. Um, again, I'm, I don't regret giving an opportunity for, for a plague to go through and, and not cause any more difficulty, but church is essential, and so here we are because of that. He is the head of the church, and I do what I do, and we do what we do because he's the one who gets to tell us what's right and what's wrong and what he expects from us. And frankly, the last thing that I could ever live with is not gathering together with the saints of God and worshiping our head. When you think of a head, what do you think of? Well, the head is the one who is the leader. The head gives the source and life. It gives direction. It gives guidance. It gives wisdom. Uh, it provides everything that we need. And as I you know, was commenting earlier, if you want to kill someone, you don't cut off their toe. It doesn't hurt them that bad. It happens to people. If you really want to kill someone, you could cut off their head because the head is everything. And all of the body, when you're in uh, some kind of, of a fit or you're going through difficulty, you're cold, every part of the body works together and gives up its blood and gives up its nutrients 
nutrients and all that it can to keep the head alive. This is the thing that has to live in the end is the head. And so it's the last part of a person to run out of oxygen, to run out of things like that. That is what we ought to be. We ought to be the ones who that all of our lives ought to be poured out and devoted for the exaltation and for the honor and for the worship of the one who loves us, protects us, and guides us and cares for us. And so he is most glorious here in the text because he is the sovereign Lord and lover of the church. He loves you. He loves his church. In Second, 1 Corinthians, excuse me, there are two places where it talks about what happens when someone destroys the church. I want to read, read those. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? Now, I'm going to stop right there because uh, in English, we no longer have the ability to know if it's a you or a you all. So the Southerners are right on this one. And I'm going to read it that way because he's not talking about little individual temples everywhere. He's talking about the temple altogether. So 1 Corinthians 3 Don't you all know, and and I'm not making fun of of the language by saying this, that you all, that's really what's there, that together, that corporately, we together are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwells in you all. So we typically think of us as individuals. Don't go out and live in sin because the Spirit of God dwells in you. That's true, but that's not what this text is saying. What this text is saying, that when we corporately come together, what we are as the body of Christ is a unique temple. And the word that's being used here for temple is, is um, there are two words for temple. One is hieron and one is naus. The difference between the two of them would be there is the temple complex, everything that you could technically call temple. And then there's that inter sanctum, the holy of holies. Is he saying here that the church is the the complex of God or of the spirit, excuse me, or is he saying that the church is the inter sanctum of God? He's claiming that the church is that special place where God and man meets. This is a reason, frankly, I'm not really trying to throw this in, it may seem like it, why the church is essential. Because as we gather together as God's people, the spirit of God dwells there. Don't you all know that you all are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? If anyone defiles the temple of God, God will destroy him. For the temple of God is holy, which temple you all are. And from chapter 6, don't you know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? And there is the individual who is in you, and you have from God, and you are not your own, for you were bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and your spirit, which are God's. So here's what those two verses, chapter 3 and chapter 6, say together. That we all are corporately the special inter sanctum of God where his Holy Spirit dwells when he comes together and we bring our individual temples together and as each drop, if, or you would think of like a measure of water, is placed here and placed here and placed here together that that one temple just grows in size and we have this glorious temple where the Spirit of God is active. And I'm believing and saying here that the Spirit of God is active in a corporate temple in ways that he never is individually. In other words, where two or three are gathered together, in my name, there I am in the midst. That's Jesus promising that he'll come and in a special way be with his people. And so it's important for us to gather together. So what does all of that mean in relation to what we're talking about here? The third reason why we ought to exalt Christ and cause him to be precious to us is because he is our head. He is our Savior, and He has given Himself. In Ephesians chapter 5, He has given His life to bring you into this special relationship. And I've had more people recently, more and more than than maybe you would ever expect, have begun to tell me, I'm really beginning to see how precious it is to gather together as a church. You know, sometimes it takes a little bit of, of a hardship for us to begin to realize what we have, and we don't realize what we have until we lose it or don't enjoy. I've, I've never missed more church in my whole life. 
although I've, I've been here, I guess, virtually every week. But to, as a, a corporate body, I, I think in my whole life, I, from what I could tell, I think my parents started to take me when I was two or three weeks old and, and never missed any time. And, and it's so grievous to me. This really, really is grievous to me to think that the church can't gather and that people, are, frankly, are testing us, frankly, to see if we consider ourselves to be essential. And we are essential because the Spirit of God dwells in us and he is glorious because he's the one who saved us and redeemed us and brought us here so that we could worship him together and become those, what does Peter call them? Living stones to reflect his glory. Tower number one to find our location or location number one where we look at Christ is relationship with the Father is what? that he is the image of the invisible God. Looking at Christ from the second angle, we can see him as he is contrasted with all of creation. He's the one who made everything, and so all creation sings his story, just praises him together. And the third way that we can look at him and love him and savor him is we can see what he has done for the church. Where would we be? if it were not for the church. The, it is the, the pinnacle and, and the, the, the power of the church, and it, it's the pin, pinnacle of truth, excuse me. It's so precious to us, and in all of those ways, we ought to stop and look at Jesus. Jonathan Edwards said it, I think, so good, when he was trying to find ways for us to think about how wonderful Jesus is in the exaltation of Christ. It's a sermon you all ought to read. I've read it more than once. I keep a copy in my office. In Christ we see infinite highness and infinite condescension. Christ, as he is God, is infinitely great and high above all. He is higher than all the kings of the earth, for he is King of kings and Lord of lords. He is higher than the heavens and higher than the highest angels of heaven. So great is he that all men and all kings and princes are worms of the dust before him. All nations are as a drop in the bucket and the light dust of the balance. Yes, and angels themselves are as nothing before him. He is so high that he is infinitely above any need of any of us, above all of our reach that we could not be profitable or help him in any way, above our conceptions that we cannot even comprehend him. What is his name and what is his son's name, if you could tell? Our understandings, if we could stretch them never so far, cannot reach up to his divine glory. Christ is the creator and the possessor of heaven and earth, and he is sovereign Lord over all. He rules over the whole universe and does whatsoever he pleases. His knowledge is without bound. His wisdom is perfect so that none can circumvent what he has said. His power is infinite and none can resist him. His riches are immense and inexhaustible. His majesty is infinitely awful. And yet, he is one of infinite condescension. None are so low or inferior, but that Christ's condescension is sufficient to take gracious notice of them. He condescends not only to the angels, humbling himself to behold the things that are done in heaven, but he condescends to such poor creatures as men. And that not only so, also to take notice of princes and great men, but, those, but of those who are the meanest rank and decree, the poor of the world. And that's you and me. Only a great Savior could look so low as to see a person like me and you and meet our needs, which is what he has done. What an awesome Lord of Lords and King of Kings he is. Father, thank you for the opportunity to come again this afternoon and look into the Word of God and to think about Christ. I pray that as we reflect on his awesomeness, that we will fight for the supremacy of Jesus, that we will savor his sweetness, his preciousness, his glory and his wisdom, his love, the fact that he condescends to lowly sinners like each of us who is here this day, we are so unworthy. We are only worthy of punishment, 
and death and wrath. But instead of that, you, would sh- you have showered us with grace and love and mercy so that we may draw near and the one who formerly was in approachable light is now the one that we will spend eternity with and we will see him as we see Jesus and see his glory as we look into the face of our Savior and maybe ask, why? Why would you save us? And maybe we'll just save our breath because we know that there's no answer other than your great love for those who are unworthy. Pray that you would help us this day to love you more, savor your sweetness. I ask it in Jesus' name, amen. 312 is the last song that we'll sing. Calvary covers it all. It's somewhat of an evangelistic song, but at this time in the afternoon, just want you to think about what he has done for you, what he's done for me. How blessed the thought. Calvary, Jesus covers it all. We don't just get to sing very much, and you know I like to sing, so uh, we'll sing all four verses. Far dearer than all that the world can impart was the message that came to my heart. How that Jesus alone for my sin did atone, and Calvary covers it all. Calvary covers it all. My past with its sin and stain, my guilt and despair, Jesus took on him there, and Calvary covers it all. The stripes that he bore and the thorns that he wore told his mercy and love evermore. And my heart bowed in shame as I called on his name and Calvary covers it all. Go up to verse 3. How matchless the grace when I looked on the face of this Jesus, my crucified Lord. My redemption complete, I then found at his feet, and Calvary covers it all. Then verse 4 in the chorus. How blessed the thought that my soul by him bought shall be his in the glory on high, where with gladness and song I'll be one of the throng, and Calvary covers it all. Calvary covers it all. My past with its guilt and stain, my despair, Jesus took on him there, and Calvary covers. How much does Calvary cover? Calvary covers it all. Lord, dismiss us in your love today. We thank you for Jesus. I ask it in his name. Amen. Thank you for coming, by the way. And what we're going to do next week, if there's no changes, we're going to switch the A to K's backwards. So if you're A to K, we're going to ask you to come at 3. And if you're K to Z, again, you can come at 11 and see which one you like better. Have a great week. Go live for Jesus.